Welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lily Weinberg. I'm here joined by my colleague Lillian Corral. How's it going, Lillian? I'm good, Lily. How are you today? I'm doing well. Great. Um, so what, what's new in, on your coast? Well, not too much, except for some personal news, which um, we'll share, which is I'm um, getting ready for the birth of my second child. So I will be starting my hiatus from coast to coast. So luckily, the, that's the most exciting news we have on the West Coast. That is, that is super exciting. Um, we are thrilled for you. And, and of course, um, we're going to miss you. Um, it, it's hard to believe that, um, that we've been doing this for almost three months. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, we'll, we'll carry on with, with, um, talking about what's happening in communities, but, um, we're, we'll certainly miss you. Yeah, we've had, um, an exciting set of conversations over the last three months. I think, um, I'm curious to see what happens over the next three months only because it just feels like you'll recall when we first started, it almost was like the world was a complete. It, it, like the world was a complete unknown. We weren't sure what the summer would look like. We were, and yet, while I feel like we have some clarity and we're getting into a routine, like we're still pretty much at a place where we're trying to figure out um, what's going to happen in our cities. So kind of, um, you know, sort of an interesting opportunity to talk even about today's episode around what's happening. In I know. It, it certainly, I mean, so much has happened in, in three months and it's it just, it's such a dynamic time. And I know um, it's just going to continue to, to evolve. And, and certainly we've seen this evolution, of course, um, in our downtowns and there's still a lot of uh, questions about what's going to happen in our downtown. So um, uh, I, my, the weather is not great here. So, so if I, uh, if I uh, log out, uh, sorry about that. I am, um, plugged in on my phone. Um, can you still hear me okay, Lillian? We can hear you okay, Lily. Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and I'll carry on. Um, I'll introduce um, the topic and, and our guest and, yeah. and then hopefully we'll, we'll figure this out. Um, so, so anyways, we will be exploring the questions that cities should ask as they work to rebuild their urban cores in equitable, inclusive ways. Um, what should community leaders um, measure as they map out this path? What lessons are we seeing from other American cities? And we'll also examine findings from two night reports on downtown revitalization. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and, and I think it should be an interesting conversation. Anything in particular from your and Lillian that you want to learn about um, as we talk about uh, downtown? Yeah, I mean, I, there's tons. I can't wait to hear um, Rick and Amy talk about this. But I mean, I think for me, what I'm really curious about is, you know, how do we make sure we are transit like it's almost like how are we reacting to what's happening in our in our communities and 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 respond appropriately and at the same time mm -hmm. also like how do we start to invest and help small businesses think about the future because i suspect this isn't the first time and in some ways you know a lot of scientists and 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 you know folks who know a lot about the world say we're going to see more of this and so in some ways it's like how do we help people pivot but also how do we help yeah. rescue our our downtowns i'm really curious about that yeah i i think we're actually i think we're going to go there for sure um and and we have two um extraordinary guests that, that are going to help us explore that um uh with amy menzer um who's a senior associate at the research firm community science and then uh rick thurman who is a senior vice president for community and economic development at the charlotte center uh, city partners a nonprofit that dri that drives community development in charlotte north carolina and and i'm excited because um, we have a local practitioner, um, Rick, who's really actively thinking about, um, you know, the future of, of downtowns and really thinking about, you know, the adaptation of, of businesses. And then um, Amy, you know, who's an expert in research. Now, I'm sorry, guys, I'm still trying to log into my Zoom, so bear with me. But as long as you can hear me, we can continue with the interview and then um, you should see me very uh, shortly, okay? Um, so give me one second. Um, so Amy and Rick, are you on the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So we'll just go ahead and and dive right in. 
Um, so Rick, I would love to start with you. Um, and, and if you can tell us, um, if you can start with um, some context setting. So how has the pandemic impacted Charlotte City Center? And what are you seeing and learning um, on the ground in real time? Yeah, thanks, and thanks for, for having me on this show. It's an, it's an honor to be here, and um, <clears throat> glad to be on with Amy as well. Um, I hope your weather improves. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's <you>. difficult. <laughs> it's difficult, right? I mean, every, every city center in the, um, in the country is, is struggling through this, so I don't want to sugarcoat it. Um, you know, Charlotte, we were relatively lucky that it was a, we were a thriving downtown, um, so uh, we we have a good base to build from, um, <clears throat> but a couple observations that we have seen that we're diving into, and one is the, so we're, so one thing I understand is that at Center City Partners, we work both in our downtown, which we call Uptown, and also South End, which is an adjacent corridor just to the south, and they're, they're next to each other, but they're pretty different. Um, so Uptown is, it's very, very difficult for the small businesses right now. And the reason why is, is we're understanding that so many of them are, are overly dependent on the, the daytime worker, um, yeah. primarily. And secondarily would be the evening events. You know, um, NBA, NFL, uh, AAA baseball are all downtown, convention center, et cetera. So um, they, those businesses have been geared to support that population. That population essentially disappeared overnight and it's been really, really hard. South End, on the other hand, is more diverse in terms of its makeup of um, entities. So there's there's an employment base, but there's also a strong residential base, and it's connected to a couple of the strong residential neighborhoods. And you could walk through South End today, and you might not realize there's a pandemic going on. Um, <clears throat> a lot of our retail, we've had no closures. Uh, most of the mm -hmm. restaurants are operating at 80 plus percent capacity in terms of uh, um, sorry, sales. Um, mm -hmm. It's not to say that it's been easy by any stretch. It's, it has been difficult depending on the type of business you are and what your space is like. Um, but we have one business owner that's at 80% in their South End location and 15 to 20% in the Uptown location. Um, the other thing I think is the importance of public space. You know, we mm -hmm. all know this inherently, a lot of us work in this, in this space, but we had this sort of combination of nowhere indoors to go and uh, lots of people living in small spaces, apartments that were just, they needed somewhere to go and they were, they were finding places that weren't, that we didn't think of as public space became public space overnight because people needed an outlet. They needed a place to just get outside and see somebody besides themselves in the mirror or their roommate. That's really interesting. Can you hear me okay, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, sorry. Audience members, we've had a few brownouts um, from the weather, so um, so it, so that's why I'm asking the question. Um, that's really interesting. So just a couple of clarification points on what you said, though. Um, so it seems like um, depending on um, which part of the city center, so like South End, where there where a lot of residents live there, it's doing pretty well um, because there's bodies walking around. But but in downtown, um, which is more dependent on on you know uh, workers coming in and out and on on um, like games, uh, is is doing a lot worse. Um, yeah, and, and then the, yeah. yeah, there are no go ahead. There are a lot of a fair amount of residents in our downtown. Mm -hmm. You know, I would argue that we absolutely need more for it to support yeah. the urban economy that we have. And and maybe they're not as interconnected to the urban economy as the, the daytime workers are. So, um, you know, the residents aren't right in the city center. They're maybe three or four blocks out. And that makes a big difference if you're a small business as to who's going to walk, you know, an extra two blocks to go to your restaurant. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Then, of course, you made the point about public spaces being really important during this time, which we've we've continued to see. So, Amy, um, I'm going to I'm going to call on you and and I would love to hear um, a, a couple of things from you. So you you started a downtown uh, revitalization research before the pandemic, before the, right. the rural. Right. No, we lost your audio. Oh, Lily, we can't hear you. No worries. I'll, I'll step in. Um, OK. Lily, um, but so Lily was just uh, going to ask Amy about the research that you started. And so maybe um, if you could just sort of 
tell us a bit about what you learned and what you think is most relevant for downtown practitioners at this moment. I think giving, given kind of the broader landscape yeah. that you get to look at through your research. And Lily, just let us know when you're back on and we'll hear back to you. Thanks, Lillian. Definitely. Um, I second uh, Rick's um, statement of being grateful to be here and to, to share this conversation with all of you. It feels very, very important and timely. Um, so the work that we started, um, I'll start with that, the work we started for the Knight Foundation, um, the task was to look at the existing research base. So what has been learned in the past about what makes a downtown effective, downtown revitalization itself effective, um, and really trying to understand um, from a a technical research perspective, is there evidence that says this is the way to do it? And then also, how do you go about measuring it? What tested tools, what um, sort of specific measures might a community use to, to really understand if it's working? And so you know, the short answer to that when it relates to downtown revitalization is that there isn't much that's been proven statistically to revitalize. But what is known is that a lot of lived experience. You know, there's a lot of commonality in literature across the board about key elements that must be in place for revitalization. Things like a business improvement district or somebody that's in charge of sort of managing, somebody like the organization that Rick works for, um, using marketing, using um, really attracting local businesses, um, the importance of public spaces. Um, in what, what I wanted to pick up on what Rick said, though, that I think is really important is within those, within those umbrella areas, one size does not fit all. <laughs> you know, it's like you have to know how to customize those buckets to the scenario that you're facing in your community. We also looked at public spaces and what can create engaging public spaces. And there is more literature around measurement in public spaces. There's more instruments that have been tested because they tend to be relational. They tend to be focusing on, does somebody feel attached to a downtown? Does somebody feel like a space is quality? And so those are easier to conduct scientifically versus trying to compare communities to try to understand if one thing affected a community differently. Um, so, for downtown revitalization, what we put in the report are the common measures that have been used in the field. Um, I do want to just let people know and encourage people that do town, town revitalization that never feel like they're doing measurement right, but it's just really hard to do. And mm -hmm. the fact that you struggle is just inherent in the process. Um, we spend a lot of time working with um, ourselves and our own knowledge of data, as well as working with um, a consultant in the development field that understands real estate to look at what data sources are available. And it's the complexity of the small sizes of downtowns and neighborhoods that make it challenging to use existing ArcGIS, census, other existing data sets that you think you should be able to use, but really have limitations. And so um, knowing that you will need to collect data if you have a specific purpose that you want to collect it for. But that doesn't have to be a barrier. It just means that you have to prioritize. Great. In terms of, do you want me to talk about now or do you want me to pause? Uh, well, I was just gonna say, okay. and for folks who are listening in the chat box, we just linked out to the downtown toolkit that was released by Knight and Community Science um, actually yesterday. And it highlights some of these tools that you're talking about and some of the, yeah. the ways and approaches that you're, you're describing. And it might be helpful for, for um, the audience to know that there, the toolkit is really focused for practitioners. It's simplified, focused on just like the nuts and bolts of what are, what is the literature says and our experience say is good to measure. And the other document is much more of a literature review. So if you kind of nerd out on that stuff, the literature review is the way to go. If you just want to get some advice, I'd go to the toolkit. Um, and I just had a couple of tips for now that, that I've been hearing as I've been talking to communities in our work. Um, I think it's not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. So, you know, really thinking about what are you trying to do, focusing on learning um, and really picking a couple core things to measure. And also um, really push yourselves not to avoid. So, that's, so maybe a better way to say that is really take the challenge of figuring out who's gonna be affected by your policies and how, I mean, that's how you get to equity. And I know we'll talk about that more later, but I think that's an, a key part in where we are right now is um, trying to wrestle with that question. Great. 
Now, Rick, can you tell us a little bit about how your organization is responding um, in support and perhaps some of the programs that you've launched specifically? Yeah, sure. And congrats Reactions on about the, to what Amy also mentioned are also great. Um, congrats on the, the publishing of that report. Um, I know many people on her team are going to dive into that. And um, so, and actually, it just segue into the answer. So I would say there's three things, but I'm gonna start with a macro thing. And that is that just before this, we were about a third of the way into our, our Center City 2040 vision plan. So this is something we do every 10 years. And <clears throat> so, so we had a choice, right? We could either just sort of keep going with the consultant we had hired and the program we laid out, all the work we put into place to push to the, through the end, or we could say, hang on a second, what are we doing? So we pressed the pause button and we hit reset and we went back out. We're now going out and re-engaging the community around, you know, we have to look at things through the, the actual, the new economic lens through sort of pandemic thinking, but also the social issues that, that we knew were important um, and we're studying and, and incorporating, but clearly the, the Black Lives Matter movement um, <clears throat> and it's sort of increasing um, prominence, thank goodness, around the country has allowed us to put a new lens on that report. So the measurements that Amy, the, the piece that she published, that's the kind of thinking that we'll, we will try to bake into to that work as well. Um, but then scaling down a little bit, um, we are working like a lot of cities to expand, you know, to expand on-street dining for restaurants just to help them get more capacity. But also, you know, we're thinking now about can, how can you expand outdoor meeting space? So we have all of these buildings that, that are worked to really sort of suck employees up into them. And, but, but now the safe place to meet is outside. We have the climate to support that. We have these sort of private plazas that are not going to be food truck radios anytime soon. So maybe there's ways we can adapt that to public, to public meeting spaces as well and, and not just be sort of single use in some of this new public space we're looking at, but also recreation. And the final thing is something that work we started literally the day we started working from home on March 14th. We started talking about um, what could be our role in response and recovery. We understood that government has to play the role of relief because relief is, is a huge number. I mean, that is a huge task to take on. And that's not something organizations like ours have the capacity to do. But what we can do is help businesses adapt. <clears throat> we understood that businesses are, some of them needed to change already, like retail is changing rapidly, yeah. um, but others were going to need to adapt their business to, to, um, to match the, the sort of COVID-19 economic reality, um, but also sort of increasing competition from different, you know, mammoth retailers um, online. So we put together this uh, Center City Small Business Innovation Fund to, it's not a relief program, you know, that it is designed to complement the existing relief programs but help our, help our small businesses adapt and innovate so that they can hopefully make it through this, but also be positioned to, to be even stronger on the back end. Great. Um, and we just linked out to the Innovation Fund program for folks that are listening in, if you want to learn more about that. Um, so I'm hearing a couple of things. I'm hearing that um, community engagement is critical. Um, I want to bring in the point that Amy brought that, you know, there's no one size fits all. You really have to understand your community and design and adapt for that. It sounds like you're really looking at adapting and, um, and modifying your public spaces and thinking about how to take everything outdoors. Um, and then also the, the point about, you know, how do we get creative about complementing government relief, right? Like government sort of takes a lead role, but there's organizations like yours that really um, do a lot of that complementary work. Amy, when you're hearing um, these kinds of examples, are there things that you think, and, and, and especially when we think about experimenting in this time versus, um, versus trying to kind of create some sort of permanency for the future, um, what are some of the measurements, what are some of the things that you think are really critical for us to track in this moment? So there is one overarching measurement that is important for both that onto revitalization and public spaces, which is movement of people. And that already came up, you know, the bodies moving. Um, it's just sort of one of those stalwart things that is important in, in Main Streets. It's, it's just understanding, are you getting people down? Because that translates into retail sales. It translates into sort of positive energy, people wanting to be in a place. 
So I think that thinking about how you measure that, including who. So it's very important not just to count bodies, but to um, think about what ages, what racial demographics, who's feeling welcome in your space. I know that's something that you all are, are thinking about in Charlotte. Beyond that measurement though, there's a reason why in our toolkits, there's a, just such a long list of measures. And it's because it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. And so the first thing we do as um, consultants when we come into a place is try to help the, a community think about really what are you trying to achieve for who and um, how do you think it's gonna happen? And that helps to figure out which of the metrics you need to push on. Um, I think in this time of piloting, what's important that I've seen is that you really want to focus on what are the low hanging fruit that you actually can get the data for quickly. You know, you can't do a massive survey so that then you can do a post survey in six months. Like it's just, you're, it's gonna be too slow yeah. for your process. And so what is data either you already have that you can look at change over time or what, um, you know, I, like in, in, um, in the example that Rick talked about with the Small Business Innovation Fund, you know, what's in the applications or what's one or two strategic questions you can put in your application that may help you understand who you're serving. And then later on, you can look at the effects of outcomes by that. If, you know, asking about race so that then you can see, did we really touch the populations we were, we were going for? Um, and just the last thought on that is just making sure you actually stop and look at it. I think communities are very good at collecting data and then never actually looking at it and thinking about what they learned. And so not losing that in the process of the iteration. That's great feedback. So um, I, Lily has been uh, back on and looking at the emerging <laughs> questions in the Q&A, which we have a ton. Um, but perhaps as we transition, we could talk a little bit about equity. Um, it's, it's sort of come up in both of your comments in terms of who, um, of who is in these spaces and, and how this is um, revitalized and for whom. So as we think about the rebuild, um, Rick, how are you thinking about equity in terms of Charlotte's um, city center and, um, and how should cities be thinking about measuring it, Amy, um, just as a follow up? Well, I feel like this could be a several hour conversation and merits that for sure. But um, I think three areas, one was with the fund I mentioned, we had a strong focus on, on minority owned businesses, um, both inviting them to apply and then and then ensuring they were granted out. And so we, we had, um, we granted our first round which we announced tomorrow, 63% of the businesses that got grants are minority owned. Um, <clears throat> but two is that the, the mural and, and Lily's background is actually in Charlotte. So that is actually looking down from our building. It's Black Lives Matter. It's, you know, other, street, other cities have done this, but now let's measure that space that was just created um, and let's see who comes. Um, let's see how they feel. Let's see, had they been uptown before? Um, and but three is with, with that um, the vision plan I mentioned, we've been talking a lot about this and struggling a little bit. Um, so Amy, thank you for making us feel better about it being hard is, you know, measure what matters. So if you say equity matters, then measure it. Um, perhaps easier said than done, but some of the things that Amy mentioned, I've been taking notes, is ensuring that as we go through this, that we are measuring um, things like feeling welcome, inclusiveness, equity, but also more than the feelings, the ec actual economic, who owns the businesses? Um, <clears throat> you know, who's in those spaces? You know, what is the, the failure rate for minority owned businesses in your, in your uptown versus non-minority owned businesses? I mean, those are the things that we, we would like to measure and have started talking about how we do that, um, as opposed to the typical ways that downtowns measure, which is, you know, jobs, relocations, residences, office space, all those things are important too, but let's go deeper. So that's great. I mean, Rick, you basically answered my question. I just have a few thoughts to add. If that's okay, Lily, should I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Add your thoughts and then, then we'll, we'll okay. I'll, I'll elevate a few questions. Okay. Um, so I think in addition to um, the, the ideas that Rick put forward for measurement, one of the things that's really important to think about is and actually track is like our, how do you know you're increasing opportunities or reducing barriers? Mm -hmm. So like building that into your measurement plan, like how are we making it easier for people to access the services and making sure that formerly disadvantaged or currently disadvantaged folks have um, not just, not just that they can apply, but that they're encouraged to apply, that they're mm -hmm. sort of, that you're removing the barriers to applying. 
Um, but stepping above that for a minute, it's really important to think about what does equity mean in your context? Mm -hmm. Who has been excluded intentionally or unintentionally? Who has been harmed by development in the past? We all, I mean, in so many of our places, urban renewal destroyed um, African-American thriving business communities. How do we sort of think about those communities and then think about how that's the equity piece, right? Not just equal, but like, how do we create better opportunities so that they can actually sort of um, regain and advance? Mm -hmm. I'll stop there because I know we want to ask questions. No, I think I think that's a, that's that's such a great point. Um, that barriers piece is a great point. Um, and if we could link um, to both uh, reports, please, in the in the chat box, because I because Amy, you really go into that deep for how we can be measuring, especially around the equity piece. And I know many many practitioners are thinking actively about that. I'm going to highlight two questions, and then we'll we'll um, we'll call it a, a wrap. Um, but the first one is from our dear friend Lee. Lee um, Kessler from uh, Charlotte, um, and uh, and so as as you both are planning for um, development of, of center cities, so so uh, Amy, this would be from you know a mm -hmm. research mm -hmm. perspective, and Rick from a practitioner perspective. Um, what assumptions are you making about the future of automobiles um, driving into center business districts? So um, Rick, I'll I'll throw that to you first. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, sort of a two part answer. And one is, you know, the future that many of us would like to see and then the current reality. And, and, and you know, as much as we talk about designing streets for people, which is a, a key element of our Center City 2040 vision plan, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. So, so how do you get there and not introduce so much pain into the process that you break your Center City in that process? And that is the balancing act. I think cities like Charlotte are, are, are trying to figure out because I mean, we are, we are a booming sort of sunbelt city that was built on sprawl. And we're now trying to kind of put the genie back in the bottle. Um, we're probably more compact than some um, Southern downtowns. Um, <clears throat> but I think the assumption is that fewer people will be driving in the future. Um, but then the challenge is there'll be more people. So how does that number balance out in the end? Mm -hmm. Amy, did you have any comments think, on this? I think the, the thing that comes to mind and not knowing Charlotte's public transportation infrastructure at all, other than assuming it's probably not super robust, um, <laughs> thinking, learning from places that have tried to make adaptations within their existing structures, like bus rapid transit, like where are their strategic cost effective in investments? Because as a planner, you know that if you, if you don't change your ordinances, if you don't change your structure, you're gonna keep getting what you've always gotten. And so figuring out, like, as you're saying, Rick, you know, as a downtown revitalization person, I understand the complexity, but you're never gonna get there if you don't start making those sort of innovations and investments and pilots and testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, last question. Um, I, I want to dive a bit into um, public spaces. And so I'll start with you, Rick. Um, anything that, that just really surprised you um, around the usage of public spaces in, in Charlotte um, in the city center? Yeah, maybe a couple things. One is the, especially early on, the number of sort of outdoor restaurant spaces that just became co-opted by people, you know, when restaurants were closed. Mm -hmm. uh, how residents just spilled into them and sort of used them as their own kind of private patio space, which tells me there's not enough public space provided, that if, if people are forced to use sort of private space, um, then that's something we have to look at. And the second is what's right behind you. Um, so yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of things we could say about it. It's been a fascinating thing as it, as it has unfolded. It sort of happened literally overnight, and then now we're sort of learning um, in, in retrospect. But one comment really stuck with me. It was in our staff meeting after this as we we're talking about it. It was an um, African-American uh, gentleman who said, you know, this is a black space uptown. And prior to this, I'm not sure I could think of a really prominent black space uptown. So the idea of black spaces, I think is a powerful one. And it was sort of gave rise to a really robust conversation as to what that means, what it looks like and how do you achieve them? And then how do you measure them to understand them? Hmm. That that's really powerful, um, and and I think the arts piece is just 
Rick, so this background that I've, that I've had ever since we chatted it has been mm -hmm. most commented on um, out of any background that, I, that I've used. It's just really extraordinary, um, this mural. Um, Amy, I would love to have your response on this um, because practitioners are actively thinking about, um, you know, how could we potentially make these, you know, th this flexibility in public space permanent? Right. And but the, but but data is really important for telling that story. So could you could you um, tell us a bit about how how, um, you know, practitioners should be thinking about that? Yeah. Um, so some of the the most common data collection methods that can be used are intercept surveys. Mm -hmm. So actually having people um, in, in the places and asking about like zip code where they come from, because I think, Rick, that helps to think about like that's an indicate. A specific indicator of welcomeness to some degree. Um, the asking about the frequency of using space, what else they were doing, because that helps you understand the multiplier effect when you're trying to quantify that movement. Um, there are, and I also want to just point the listeners to the existing questions that are um, in the toolkit in the appendices, because there are some robust questions that get at quality of the public space, the amount of how safe people feel, which is really critical. Um, how welcome they feel. And I think the safety one is one that's really probably changing within COVID because of course there's not questions about how pe safe people feel um, from the virus, but there are questions that probably can be adapted. And that's a, a, a big determinant of whether people will use the space, which is like, like perception. Important. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 Their yeah. perception of safety. And, the, yeah, and yeah. really the literature says you have to find a balance. Yeah. You can over, you can over control a space, especially right now as we think about, um, um, systemic racism, that's a really important consideration. But then you also, there are other indicators, there are other ways that you can manage a space to help people to actually feel space. And there's some of that information documented in the literature review about what literature has found about this. Got things. it, got it. Well, we'll, we'll end on that. Um, check out the toolkit. Um, Lillian, come on back in. Um, mm -hmm. And, and thanks for, for being an a amazing teammate, Lillian. We will miss you. Um, sorry about all the technical issues, um, Rick and Amy and Lillian. Um, thanks for taking over the interview. But I really enjoyed talking to, to both of you about downtown revitalization and how you know, cities really can be thinking about, um, about continuing to measure this work um, and, and new innovative ideas. So really, really appreciate it. Um, and, and so next week, um, on Coast to Coast, um, we will be talking about um, equity and, and the 10 minute um, uh, walk rule and how cities really can be thinking about um, how to um, you know, reallocate funds in their budget um, more equitably um, in communities that don't have access to green spaces. So, so it should be an interesting conversation. Um, and, um, and Lillian, um, we're not sure if you'll be there, but, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you then. Yes. We'll see with two babies. <laughs> yes, exactly. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Stay well. Bye. Thank you.